people want to like write good code and be good coders. Well, the way you do that is writing bad code. Like mm. I'm winning by losing. Like if you're willing to lose and write bad code or make bad companies, that's actually winning because that's getting you closer to a good company. Do you have any tips and tricks when you're ready to start making content, how you shift yourself? Oh my God, I forgot these little, here, you wanna, you wanna pry, pry these open? With yeah, your... let's pry these open. I actually, it depends on the type of content I'm doing, I guess. I get most nervous, I'd say, if I'm doing a, like, speaking on stage sort of thing. Huh. But now, if I'm making most content and it's recorded on YouTube, I don't get too nervous. Um, because it's like, worst case, I mess up and do it again. But also, for me, it's the first five seconds they're nervous. And then if, if I'm like actually like grooving with the content, I no longer am nervous after the first like mm. X amount of time. So it's almost the same skill you need to learn when you're like, I don't know, skateboarding or skiing, where like you actually just have to go do it and be scared for the first five seconds to like get over it. And the faster you do that, the less nervous you have to be. I remember you actually made hours and hours of videos without your face on before you started to do with yes. adding it back. So I think a big part is to your point on practice, yeah? Yeah, funny, I think I actually just didn't own a camera too. Part of it was like, I don't even think it was like a purpose, let's not show my face on camera either at first. It was, yeah. I didn't own a camera and I was like, other coding tutorials don't have their face either. So like, it's why like show fine. mine? All right. Yeah. Like why show mine? I'll just like do it like that. And I didn't want to like get all the camera equipment first before I even knew what I was doing. So, so what so prompted that first decision to let the world see who Ben Awad was? Well, I'll tell you the full story of like why I got started on YouTube. Part of the, part of what like triggered it, I don't know why, but I was 16 when I did my first Java course, uh, it was a programming class. Wow. And after that, I started making Android apps because Android is like they use Java to build the apps. And I had an Android phone. I was like, I want to actually start building stuff with the like programming language that I learned, not just yeah. like do like silly examples, which is what you do in your classes. So I started building stuff. Maybe I think it was like 17 before like I actually like was doing the Android things for real. And I decided to live stream myself on Twitch doing that. I don't know why I did it. Hmm. I'm like this kid that has no idea what he's doing. I'm coding a to-do list, but I am getting errors everywhere. I'm basically just Googling for four hours. Like there's like a four hour video on YouTube right now. If you scroll down, it's like my last video yeah. or my oldest video. And it's me like making terrible content that is figuring out how to make a to-do list app. So I post it on YouTube afterward. It's just to archive it or save it, whatever. Like yeah. Twitch is like, you know, send it to YouTube. I'm like, okay, sure. Um, and I don't look at it, touch it for a year. And a year goes by and I look at my YouTube channel again. And I think I like did a couple other streams, but I didn't record those or whatever. I, I kind of like got out of the like streaming thing with You Cody. tried it. I one tried and it. Done. And, like, what was I done. Well, funny enough, it was not one and done. I did a couple of them. Okay. Um, but then I just kind of, yeah, I didn't feel like streaming myself doing bugs with no people watching. And I don't know why I was doing it in the first place. But the YouTube channel, after a year, got 10,000 views on that video. And I was like, holy crap. Like when you're a kid and you're like, you know, that's that's a ton of views basically. And I was like, man, I have made it. I got 10,000 views. Like what? And I also was thinking like, this is terrible content. Like I have posted this video. It is four mm. hours long or two hours long. It's so long. It's me not knowing what I'm doing. I could make more of those, but better because that is awful. Like, I'm not trying to make it good content. I was like, huh, what if I just tried to make that better? And that was when I got like, all right, time to like try making more YouTube videos. And I just started doing what I like doing, which was coding. Yeah. Um, and I just was already doing it on the side. And I just continued like that process while also recording while I did it. And I was just, and oh, funny enough, my yeah. face was in those videos too. So like that mm. was my first video on YouTube. It like literally has me in the little corner. Cause like streaming, it's normal. Like normally yeah. you just put your like little face in the corner. But like on YouTube videos, like for coding trails, most people don't, some people do. So it was just one of those things where like, yeah, I'm just not going to stick it there. And it wasn't, that one actually wasn't uh, me being nervous about like showing my face on camera thing. Yeah, I was self-conscious of my videos at first, so I didn't tell anyone that I was 
doing videos. Like yeah. no one knew I was doing it until like maybe, I don't know, like 50 videos in. So I made like a ton of videos. And then I think mean, that's the first time I like told my parents or something. I was like, yeah. So like, this is a thing. I'm like posting videos now. FYI. How do they react? Oh, they were cool. They, they like totally support it. <laughs> so it was, it was never a thing that like I thought people would like think I was a cringe or anything or like make fun of me. It was more of like, I just was self-conscious of myself, like making bad things and I didn't want people I knew to like see the bad things that I made yeah. and so to like take that burden off of myself I just didn't tell anyone I just posted and like let the algorithm like have people find me on search yeah. or whatever and like that was how I started do you still feel that sometimes the self-consciousness around creating something that might not be your standards the funny thing is I would say when I get to new platforms sometimes so if there's a platform mm -hmm. that I haven't started posting on yet and I know I have some friends that are on that platform already. Sometimes they'll feel it to some degree. Like I think the platform I felt that for last was LinkedIn. Because I remember I never, like I was posting content on YouTube and Twitter. And that's like normal. And that's like places you post content. But I had like professional connections on LinkedIn, <laughs> right? And so it felt weird to like start like posting like uh, content on there that was not necessarily. <laughs> post. Exactly. Not exactly like the <laughs> most professional. Um but yeah, I mean, I got over the hurdle of just like, you know, we're just going to post and then I post again. And then you just like, by now it's just like, well, I, I just don't care at all. You are a LinkedIn post. influencer now. I like LinkedIn a lot. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think a lot of people sleep on it because it's like, it's biz they think it's too business. And like, I just look at it as Twitter, like a different, it's Twitter, but like a slightly different audience. I also love, yeah. I feel your content has really grown as you've grown as a person from 16 year old doing coding tutorials yeah. to capturing all of the different projects you worked on yeah. through some of those projects and videos you met really important people in your life and now you're doing your own company and startup and the videos yeah. are about that it's sort yeah. of like as Ben Owad grows and so goes the channel that's actually how I want it to be I never actually wanted to be a coding channel per se that's why my, my, my channel is named Ben Awad. It's not like Ben, Awad ben coding. coding or like something like that. Because I always codes. wanted to be, yes, what is Ben doing? Ben happened to be doing coding tutorials and like learning coding and like that. So that's what he made content about. Then Ben was like interested in doing startups and like building stuff. So he made videos about that. And so it's like every part of like what I'm into and doing, I like would want to make that content, not necessarily yeah. coding. But I will say like I know my audience is also like coding oriented. So and I love coding. So it'll always be probably some tech related thing. Yeah. But also because you like coding. But I like coding. Yeah. <laughs> it's so. a pretty good mix. Yeah. Yeah. So we're here today. The man, the legend, you might have heard him introduce himself as Ben Awad, but sometimes he introduces himself as Ben Awad. Awad. <laughs> There's no actually known pronunciation of his last name, but he's Ben and he's here. And we're going to play 36 questions to fall in love. I'm ready to fall in love. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, there was a study the New York Times wrote about they paired random couples of people with questions designed to promote vulnerability, I share, and reciprocity, you share. Turns out those are the keys to building deeper relationships, not just romantic, but friendships as well. And many of the couples from that, they became friends. One couple did end up getting married. Jeez. So stakes, stakes are very high. I'm excited. And also for those of you who don't know, Ben is currently staying at the Kara house. I am. We've really been through a lot together, including fighting off wild possums yeah. and fixing broken water lines. So the way I see it, we've really been through the experience part, but now it's time for us to, to talk about it, to get to know each other Going properly. even deeper. Yeah, exactly. So this starts with prolonged eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to stare deeply into each other's eyes, really appreciate the other person. I didn't know this is part of the podcast. Okay. Oh yeah, this. absolutely is. Surprise. <laughs> I can <And> stare. <laughs> then the first person to look away, uh -huh. to break eye contact, or alternatively, blink. You just broke. Hey, hey, we haven't started. <laughs> whoa, whoa. All right. Okay, I got you're my getting, first win in the books. You're like, Phew. Or if your eyes get too dry and you blink, you also lose. The oh, first I'm going to insta lose then. I blink all the time. Oh, my eyes are also pretty terrible. <laughs> so the, the first person, they're going to end up drawing the card. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Three, 
two, one, intimacy. I already want to lose. <laughs> that was way too soon. Wait, we're going to do that again. We're going to do that again. Oh, God, my eyes. Two okay. wins. Let's go. I think both of us have really watery eyes. Yeah, we do. I can feel like your eyes are watery <laughs> yeah. and like mine are too. <laughs> this is where all the sleep deprivation goes. The, how much did you even sleep last night? Like six, seven hours. Yeah. Dude, it's, I went to bed at like five. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm doing, I'm doing quite a bit better than I have a little bit of an unfair advantage. Okay. Three, two, one. These types of games, I don't mind losing to. I can't talk or I'll lose. You just talked. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. That was vegan. We lasted longer. We lasted longer. Yeah, I always will complain whenever I do games like that. I've actually never heard you complain about literally anything in our entire friendship together except for this moment right now. I, whenever I'm under like like activities that are like that, I will always complain. I'm a, I'm a big complainer until I'm not. So what, physiological stress? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, but, like when I'm like putting myself under like, I guess physical pressure. I don't know if you consider that physical, but I'll, I'll like how I cope through like staying through it longer is by just like squirming. Smart. Yeah. You know, studies have shown that when you're, when you're in pain yep. and you curse, you shout an expletive. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Like, ah, f yeah. Actually lessens the pain. Yeah. Caveat. It doesn't work if you curse all the time. <laughs> so there's clearly something around breaking the taboo, doing something you don't normally do that helps relieve a little bit of pressure. Yeah. So I wonder if complaining is that for is me? that for you? <laughs> it might be, but also I actually think I probably complain at least in my head. So it is at least happening if I'm not saying it. Do out you loud. have like a strong internal voice, like a monologue going on? Like I am Ben. I would probably say the answer is yes to that question. I think the answer is yes. As your inner Ben yells, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I'm somebody who thinks a lot in my own head. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So you know, some people out there they don't have an inner monologue. I've heard people say that they just like are not like kind of terrifying. It is. Yeah. But then, so two thoughts. The first thought is there's literally an entire religion you can look up mm -hmm. where somebody thought that the voices inside your heads come from God, mm. and that's actually deities speaking to us on what to do. Mm. You know, for whatever reasons, that hasn't really taken off. But this is like a <laughs> actual like Greek philosophy or religion. Oh, wow. Kind I of wild. Yeah. The second is, you know, on the one hand, I'm like people who don't have voices in their heads are like freaks of nature. On the other, I'm like, they might me. have it easier. <laughs> exactly. Like one might argue that the connection between our unconscious and what we do, mm -hmm. the shorter you can make that, the better. Because your unconscious Ben is still Ben. It's still he's still doing what he wants to do. It's just without going through all of no overthinking. Do you yeah. feel there are moments where you've overthought things? 100%. What do you feel like you overthink the most around? Mm, that's a good question. I would say in general, I like can catch myself overthinking and I will stop, but it can be from anything. I will even like play conversations in my head before I have them with people of like yeah. how I think the conversation might go. And so that's like just like, uh, I'd say the most Ooh. common example of, like, hmm, I wonder like, well, how that's going to go. I, I, I respond like this and then I'll respond like that. I love it. It's kind of like shadow boxing yes. but with conversational yep. wit. Yep. Also, I've done this as well before too. <laughs> I don't think I've done it with you, but that'd be really funny. If like 15 minutes before this podcast, Ben and Eric are fighting inner demons. Right. It's like, I'm going to say this and then he's going to say that. And there's like a montage of the two of us. Yeah, so conversing. It, I'll do it for us. Like, for example, this podcast, I have no idea what's going to be asked, so I don't even think about that. Yeah, this Like, is if fun. I'm about to, like, call a call support person, I, like, in my mind got my script set up. I wonder Ooh. what they're going to say. Like, uh, that's that's where I'm, like, prepare almost, like, my in my brain, like, how it's going to go down. Okay, two, two other situations. One, say you're about to pitch Void Pet. Yep. Do you have a script prepared? No. <laughs> and that's a bad thing. I feel like I should have one. <laughs> But that one, I do not. I mean, I like, I'll like go like try to pitch in my head, like, oh, I wonder what in this context, how I should pitch it. But I probably should have like, I don't know, like three pitches like that are like kind of contextual for different situations. I just like blink out. I'd say like for the most part, I will just say like, 
it's a Pokemon X mental health game and I leave it at that. And like, I don't pitch more than that, but I would say that's like a weakness. That's so no, that's a strength. That's oh. the way to do it. So okay. I just took some acting classes for the first time mm-hmm. earlier this month and it's method. They said, you don't memorize your lines. You learn them mm-hmm. because when you memorize them, it comes out a little bit too rote in a way. Yeah. You're not trying to memorize the exact things. Then you just get the Ben Awadatron 5000 when it comes to pitching. You're just remembering the main points. It's yeah, you I are. agree your with life. that. No, that's how I do my videos too in YouTube is I will have like the ideas that I want to talk about or like the general, like how I want to like do the sentence if I'm going to say like a more scripted video. But I will never like read off of something or like rote memory it back. I will always like, this is the idea I want to like get across and then like yeah. next line and I will just like say it how I want to say it's it. It's natural. Yeah. The second... Situation I was gonna ask you if you ever pre play. Say you're in a first date. Oh, uh, no, I actually don't. Ooh, so you just so come in. I, I'm, I'm very, in some situations, I'm very like, I refuse to think about them beforehand. In other situations, yeah. I'm very like, I wonder how X, Y. The other thing is, if I know there's like a lot of variance to what could it happen, then I like, am like, Ben, you're, you're not even gonna like start thinking about that. Like, there's too many decision trees that could happen. Like, so just, what I'm hearing, it's like for, Trivial planned things, yes, like, like customer support. Yes, like that's when you'll run it in your that's head. That's when I like, like, will think it through uh, a bunch. I also think just like in making YouTube videos or like running a company, there's a lot of things that you can like dumb down a little bit. And I just think in general, okay, this is it depends on the person. If you're an overthinker, yeah. um, so every, you can't take this advice for everyone because some people okay. do need to think a little bit more. But if you're an overthinker, a lot of times just like doing it is going to be like way better than like the whole thinking process. Like just making that video and seeing how it turns out, just make another one. Like, and and you like learn way more than the like 3d chess in your brain about the YouTube video. Can I say to love the caveat caveat where you're like, some people do need to think a little bit more. Yeah. So this isn't apply to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Some people, yeah. Yeah. You're like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to make this clear. Some people this is for overthinkers, more. overthinkers. That's my advice. So what's really helped me is, so as you know, I also started to post on LinkedIn. Yep. And like 95% of the time I'm about to post something, I'm like, this is bad. And I felt that a lot actually. In my, a lot do you still my feel life. that? Or now you're like, this is God work I'm dropping. <laughs> uh, so I'd say I feel the second one like more now, but there's still yeah. sometimes I feel the the latter or the first one. Um, but at the beginning, I like almost anything I ever created, I was like, I post it and I'd be like, this is bad. Uh, and I just have to do it though. That's what helped me. I'm like every single work day that's not a holiday, I have to post something. Yep. Even if it's bad. Yep. Quantity has a quality in itself. Yep. You might have heard there's a study where rather a class photography professor asked his students to take photos. And one group, he said, your job at the end of this month is to take the best possible photo that you can. And the other group, he said, like, your goal is just to take 10,000 photos. Yep. And I'm sure you can guess at the end of the month, which group actually just had straight up better photos yep. universally. Yep. I've heard the same thing with pots and pottery. Really? And making pots. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if this is just like an apocryphal group of quote makers <laughs> who are like photos and pots and artisanal handbags. He made 10,000 artisanal handbags and each one was better than the last. Yeah. I think the other thing with content is not only does like the content like get better, but for you, your mental of how you think about the content helps a lot by doing it consistently at first because you gain the confidence to post. Because once you have the confidence to post, you don't have to post as much. You can like work on the quality of it, but it's hard to work on the quality Mm. before you have the confidence in my opinion. Like first getting the reps in. Exactly. You got to like kind of get like, and then once you kind of understand that, then like, yeah, there's a point in time where like you do want to like kind of make quality videos. You don't always want to just like post for the sake of posting, but at yeah. the beginning you should. Yeah, and that's what I did. I, that's basically what I did with myself. It's like at the beginning yeah. I would post because I needed to post. And once I got to a po- point where I like I understood what posts did well and what posts didn't do well, I didn't really need to post for the sake of posting bad posts. I'd be yeah. like, yeah, you know what? I can just wait till I want to do a good post. I like but that. also like. It depends on what like point you are in your content journey, how you feel. Like for example, if I'm out of the game, I haven't posted for a while. Even though I think I know what quality content is, I'll just post videos to get like yeah, the grooves to get back into and, it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So we're gonna play a few different questions. 
I'm going to start with level one. Level one are questions about Sweet. seeing if you can guess things about me. Ooh. Level two are if I ask the question, it's about me trying to guess things about you. Okay. And level three is things we appreciate about the moment between us together. Exciting. So here goes level one. Do I seem like someone who would get a name tattooed on myself? No. Why? Or, I didn't even finish the question. <laughs> no. Why or why not? Well, one, I don't think you have any tattoos right now. That's how you, that's as far as you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, at least you don't have any obvious tattoos. And I feel like name tattoos are ones you put in obvious places. Uh, I mean, occasionally I think you maybe you don't, but I think based on there's no obvious tattoos on you. I don't think you're doing that. Would you ever get a tattoo? I could possibly see you with a tattoo, but I don't think so. And then I double don't think it's going to be a name tattoo because I feel like you'd do a symbol or something if you're going to get a tattoo, not a name. So yeah, that's my rationale. This is where I take off my shirt and it says just Ben Owad <laughs> tattooed across my chest. I yeah. love you. Amazing. All your TikTok comments Fake below. News. I'm Fake on news. my knees, Ben, for you. <laughs> Turns out th those were all Eric. Yeah, actually. You, those were made Eric a lot counts. of bots, man. Thank Took you so a lot much. of time. Yeah. But I did it for you. biggest fan right here. <laughs> yeah. It's like a Stephen King misery moment. Yeah. It's like, I need you to go back and make more thirsty TikToks. Please. Please. So you are correct. Shockingly, I don't have a name tattooed on myself currently. Also, no don't, don't, don't plan to. You know, I actually would love to get a tattoo. And I think... Again, it sort of goes to the nature of orthodoxy and taboo I alluded to when I spoke about cursing. I think I want a tattoo precisely because it's not what a standard, good Asian American boy would do. You got or, a rebel over here. Exactly. I think ex very appeal to it is because someone like me normally wouldn't. But the funny thing is, like living in LA, like everyone's got tattoos. Uh, yeah, now. I was gonna say there, it's a. Uh, I can see it both ways. So now it's yeah. like not even like a rebel thing. Now I'm kind of yeah. like, well, it, it is kind of neat. It's a rebel for yourself, but not for other people that look at you. Exactly. Yeah. What about you? Have you ever thought of getting a tattoo? Slash, do you have a tattoo? I do not have a tattoo, and I mean, I've like remote, like thought about it a little bit, but honestly, I don't know what I would get. And two, I just don't think I'm that into like tattoos, and I very much don't like needles. So oh, I don't like needles. Either. Yeah. The whole the whole thing about getting the tattoo. Plus, I don't have a strong desire of like anything I want. I'm probably just not going to. You be a literally tattoo described person. every single aspect of getting a tattoo as like a thing you don't like about it. You're like, I don't yeah. like the needles. I don't know what it would be. The concept of something <laughs> exactly. on me. I don't know. Exactly. But like overall, you're like, yeah, I thought about it. Well, I, you know, you had to think about it to know you didn't want it. That's good. See, this is me overthinking again. It maybe saved you from getting a bad tattoo. That is true. Wait, so, okay. <laughs> if you had to get a tattoo right tomorrow, like say there's a tattoo artist just hiding in the wings right yep. there. This is all planned. Yep. What, what would it be of? Um, so I think I would get something small maybe on my wrist or something, and it'd be like some kind of like small symbol. I think I'd like something cool. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't know what even the real I definitely don't want to do a coding thing because that's too geeky I am uh, a geek but I don't want to be the geek that has it like labeled on his body like I'm not trying to do like you know any formulas or like what would be like a coding tattoo like brackets I brackets the word void like Ooh. Uh, yeah oh that's it, a deep it, one void yeah. it's like it also reflects the inner abyss within me and but I'm also a coder there's like so many th like things that people have you seen programmers get void tattooed I don't know if I have I actually haven't seen that many that'd be so like, bad programmer static tattoo. void exactly like I'm about to put my favorite function there or something like no <laughs> no uh, I could do an animal maybe um I don't know what animal I would do but what, what about a void do. pet I could see doing a void pet too. I like that less because like, I don't want to be the person that like puts their own product on their like body. Like I think that's a little cringe too. Like I, I don't know that, but that's like, just like how I feel about it. Yeah. And like if other people want to put like their company tattooed on them, like respect, like I think you got balls and like <laughs> fair, but that's not what I'm trying to do on my wrist. So you're thinking an animal. I guess you do an animal. What's your favorite animal? I like giraffes. <laughs> okay random interesting i've literally never heard that before why i like them because they're tall they just like look cool they're tall they're derpy looking giraffes look like horses as if they were designed by committee i know it's so cool 
they're like they're so weird looking like what's going on there you know when male giraffes try and fight for courtship they will fight each other by slamming their long necks yes. into each other you've yes. seen this it's yes. like really terrifying yes, it's amazing it really giraffes also fascinatingly enough were a point of contention between darwin and lamarck oh. different evolutionary theorists i, I don't know if you know recall this, this. so no. Darwin's whole theory of evolution is, hey, species have mutations. These mutations are random, right? But these randomly selected mutations, the ones that are more favorable for the environment and they're in, those are the creatures that are going to survive and propagate and spread those mutations on, right? It's like the mutation itself is random, but then some selection of them are going to carry on. So Lamarck was thinking of the opposite. is like, no, 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 no. The way it works, it's not random. It's like what you're trying to do. So like giraffes evolve because there's like a horse or something. And it's like, yo, I like want to get those leaves up there. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like each, each horse generation, like try to like stretch its neck yeah. like a little bit more. And like, that's why they have long necks. That's amazing. And so it turns out Darwin was mostly right. But then Lamarck and away got the last laugh. There's oh. this whole field called epigenetics. Uh -huh. And epigenetics state that the expression of a gene, your genetic material, is something that can be affected by your environment and how you live. So Darwin's still correct in that the mutations are random and some are passed on because they help your survive better or not. I don't know what potential genetic mutation is like, oh, let's make them half blind, but you know, like whatever. Clearly we're, we're still alive here. Wow, I love how you knew this entire story about giraffes. Oh, yeah. No, just like, I, bam. Just trying. But the fascinating thing is, so epigenetics, it turns out, though, Lamarck has an aspect uh -huh. correct where how you live your life, you know, like, oh, uh, oh, uh, in your necks, <laughs> right? It does express the genetic expression that can be passed down. And so, you know, nature versus nurture, it's not just you are your genes. There's an element where, like, no, you can alter the expression of that genetic code depending on your own lifestyle, which is kind of cool. Amazing. Their so, lifestyle of stretching their neck really paid off. Yeah. So I, I also like giraffes. There's also Sorry. a really cool Pokemon called Giraffe Rig. Uh huh. I don't know if you remember it. I've seen it. Yeah. It's like a giraffe. The front part's a giraffe. The bottom part's like an evil demon black tail creature. Yep. Giraffe Rig is also a palindrome. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay. And then the newest Scarlet and Violet, they released its evolution called uh, Fear Giraffe. Oh, I haven't seen that. I need to see that. You got to check it out. It's like okay. a giraffe Pokemon with like an armor neck and fair giraffe is also still a palindrome and that makes me happy. So, oh, wow. They did that on purpose. I bet. They did. Yeah. So honestly, man, as we talk about it, I'm like, yeah, you, you, I, I can you, see you, the you, appeal. You see the, you see the giraffe appeal now? You're on the but, same. But for you, you're kind of like tall boy, go be tall. Yay. Yeah. I'm not going to get a giraffe tattoo. I know that for sure, but I like giraffes. I get like a different animal, I think. I think a giraffe tattoo would be so cool because you could have like the giraffe body and then it's just the giraffe neck. <laughs> All the way up to that here. Would be so troll. I feel like you are like fifty percent more likely Actually, now to get a giraffe tattoo. I kind of like that. If I was gonna do a tattoo, do I do it like that? Yeah, and then like you could have like you know those like things with like the, your thumb sticking in the sleeves, and you see like the giraffe. If head. I'm gonna go all in, I'm gonna do it like that. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then it's like full giraffe, a full giraffe sleeve, just the whole jungle up my arm. Do you feel any spiritual attunement and similarity with a giraffe? You know. I would not say that. I don't think I... <laughs> You're like, no, in no way whatsoever. I mean, you know, I, maybe I guess I could call giraffes my spirit animal, um, but I actually don't think I'm like... I wouldn't say that would be my spirit animal, I don't think, because um, they're too derpy. And like, I mean, I guess we're like both like a little bit tall, so like there's that, but like I don't think I'm like absurdly tall like a giraffe. Like giraffe's like, you know, an NBA player. Like if you're an NBA player, I could see like my spirit animal being a giraffe. Yeah. I think it's more of just like, I don't know. I just saw giraffes. I was like, yeah, that's like a nice animal. I want that one to be my favorite. I like and like it. no one else thinks about giraffes no. or talks about giraffes as a favorite. Well, you want me to say tiger? Like, like maybe another, I want to be another tiger person? Like, heck no. You're a giraffe boy. I'm a giraffe boy. I think for me, if I were to get a tattoo, so one, honestly, I thought of myself, like if we hit our next round of funding or IPO, I should get a carrot tattoo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I will be that cringe boy yeah. if it helps motivate the team. I mean, if you're at IPO or a huge round, I can see that it's also like, uh, that makes more sense. Kind of like, I don't remember from the office, but Andy Bernard at one point to incentivize his team says he'll get a tattoo on his butt of their choice. Yeah. Like similar energy. I also think it's just like a fun PR stunt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I've considered it. It turns out there's a startup that does ephemeral tattoos, not like henna, like oh, actual ink tattoos, but they disappear so after a year. But here's the thing, Ben. Yeah. It's a startup. 
you and I as founders both know that half of what they do is a little, a little scuffed, a little off. And I'm like, these are supposed to fade after a year, man. The startup hasn't even been around for a year. How, how do I know? <laughs> How do I know these are ephemeral? What if, what if it's not? What if it stays? Yeah, oh, that sorry. Be so funny. <laughs> That's a bug. Guess it doesn't fade. Free permanent tattoo. <laughs> terrifying. That would be terrifying. Yeah, I don't want that. The, the other tattoo I thought, it's very stip- stereotypical. But I thought you did want a tattoo. What happened, Eric? You getting a little nervous I don't, I don't thinking know. about it? I don't it? know if I want a company permanent tattoo. <laughs> yeah, just be associated with yeah. care for the rest of my, you know? One guy was like, why isn't your Instagram handle like, Eric Carrot or like Carrot Eric, like it rhymes. Like, <laughs> why wouldn't you just I want like your that. entire identity completely to the last atomic particle just to be what your startup is? I was like, no, I'd like to keep my name, not just be Carrot Eric. Like, I'd like to be just <laughs> Eric. Eric. He's like, what? <laughs> so the, the other tattoo I get, and this is a little stereotypical, but I, I mm-hmm. still think I might get it. Have you heard of semicolon tattoos? Yes. Yes. So for those of you who don't know, it's for suicide awareness, right? Because the whole thinking is, when it's a period, that's a full stop. Yep. But it's on a semicolon, they keep going. Yep. And I, I, I like that, right? I've, yep. I've been through periods where I'm like, oh, it's hard, but I'm going to get through it. But I, I want to like, get it. I like simple tattoos. Yeah, I like yeah. simple tattoos. I just feel like now that everyone knows what a semicolon tattoo is, it's not... It's, it's not a little mainstream. Obscure. Exactly. I want yeah. something a little not mainstream. Yeah. I want to, I want to feel special. Yeah. I mean, you maybe you could try another piece of uh, exclamation point or a uh, question mark. Just like a wing ding. <laughs> yeah, just like. Just build your own philosophy and yeah. background behind it. This wing ding represents being resilient. Yeah. Then you're cool again. Because wing dings could be taken as expletives. You don't type out the expletive, you just put a bunch of wing dings. And when you're resilient, yeah. just let yourself go. Boom. You really made that work. Backstory. Here. Oh, yeah. you know it. Yeah. All right, let's do, let's do another one. Let's do, a, let's let's do another, podcast, another, another level one. Another level one. All right. It takes the one at the very end. <laughs> Wild card. Maintain eye contact. For okay, we did seconds. this one. All right, we're doing a different one. <laughs> All right, here, I'll pick one in the middle this time. I feel like there's a coding joke to be made here on like sorting and ordering and first in, first Zero out, index. last in, last yeah. out. Exactly. How many speeding tickets do you think I've gotten in my life? Okay, I feel like the answer is either like zero because you seem like an extremely responsible person or like a f- ton because you're an actual raging psychopath. And this is just like the calm Patrick Bateman-esque demeanor behind which lurks the mind of a speed demon. So We're I think it's find out. a very bimodal, like it's one or the other. I'm going to say um, I'm gonna say no speeding tickets, but you probably should have gotten some. Yeah, I have a single speeding ticket. Yeah, what happened? Uh, I was going over the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. No, it was <laughs> basically, uh, you know, it's the same thing everyone always does where you're just like driving long distance and you're like, yeah, I want time to go down. And like, it's a small town and you know, the small town's trying to make money. You think no one's out at that time of night, but they are and you just get a ticket. And then this you're is like, like the most like structural analytical approach I've heard to getting a ticket. It's, it's like, like the standard, you know. You're like, I'm optimizing for reduction of time. They're optimizing for fucking me over and making money. So, you know. And that's how the transaction went down. <laughs> and now I have a ticket on my record. Do you speed a lot, Ben? No. After that, I was traumatized. <laughs> like, actually, you're just like, holy f***, I was I'm, I, I'm like, I'm like, definitely like more safe than I was yeah. after that incident. Because I was, I'm like, I was always like a pretty safe person, but I was like a little less safe because I was like, I've never seen it happen. And it's never happened to me. Well, I mean, obviously I've seen it happen, but I was like, it's never happened to me. And like, there's definitely no cops out tonight. And then it happens to you. You're like, oh wait, these things actually happen. Yeah. Is this moments where you're like, everything in life happens to everyone else, right? And then you realize I'm part of everyone else to everyone else. Exactly. Exactly. And also, I mean, also the downside is like it's 300 bucks, like it's 200 bucks. Like yeah. that's the downside of like, I mean, honestly, like saving you, pro- it's probably saved me more than like, you know, five hours. Let's let's take this parking ticket question. I'm going to blow it up a little bit existentially. Yeah. When, when was the moment you realized you weren't invincible? Mm. That's a good question. I actually think I always knew that, funny enough. That one I actually didn't have a problem with. You were like, I was born in pain. <laughs> yeah, like I think like I knew pretty well growing up. I was never the person that was very daredevil-esque yeah. or like trying to like push the limits of my body. I've never broken a bone either. So like it didn't wow. need to like break anything to like have that moment. I think I was always just like 
naturally like a little bit of a scaredy cat for whatever reason uh speeding i was you know willing to do that i was not as scared you're trying to save time yeah like that that one was like an easy transaction of like the downside was like because obviously like when you speed you're not i was i was never someone that was going like way way over the speed limit like you're going like i think i was going like freaking 10 over the speed limit and so it was not like insane um but obviously it was still illegal so there you go (laughs) um and yeah, I, I like always was a pretty safe person. And like, I was never doing, sp- I did not like football growing up. I played football cause I grew up in Texas. Yeah. Um, I never liked any of the contact sports, wasn't good at it. And I never like, I always knew my body was like, not just like this <laughs> beast, like huge tank that could just like take damage. So it started young. You make you know? it sound like a, like a Pokemon build. <laughs> You're like, I'm not like a defensive I, tank. I was not, I was not defensive. But you've taken a lot of risk, I'd say, like existentially, right? Yes, I'm actually totally down taking like intellectual risk or like uh, bodily risk is the the one that I'm definitely on the safer sure. side of. But after that, I'm all hand. I'm like, I think a lot of things people think are risky are just not that risky. What do, what do you mean? Intellectually, uh, I mean a simple example is like people think making YouTube like channels like risky. Of like, for example, what happens if it fails, and then like all of a sudden you spent like I don't know a year trying to make that work instead of like going and doing an internship, for example, or something else. And I just don't think it's as risky as uh, people think. Um, and yeah, running your own business is like kind of the same way. Even if the business fails, and this is also like how I did all my YouTube videos, yeah. like all the like things that I did, I like went in knowing if it failed, it's fine because, well, the funny thing is with, if you're making content and like doing some kind of business at the same time, if your business is doing well, that's good content. Mm. If your business is doing bad, that's double good content. If you have the balls to post it, Ooh. that's the problem. It's like no one wants to talk about them quitting their project or like the project like falling out or like things happening that are like nasty. Um, that's just like the guts of the thing. So if you're willing to do that, then all of a sudden, like it's a win win what happens with yeah. the business because it's like entertainment on YouTube either way. Um, so that's how I thought about it. And that also like allows you to like make better decisions for the company anyway. Um, so yeah, I just, I think I've always had a very, what from the outside perspective looks very risky yeah. of what I'm doing. Cause I obviously, so after college, I like never got a full-time job. So like a lot of people would say that's like very risky. Like what is he mm-hmm. doing? Um, but to me it was always like, this is not risky. And in fact, it's just like what I wanted to do. And I think it's funner. Like I'm having a great okay. time. So I like the way you deal with risk is, well, actually I'm going to rig the game. So the downside is still a plus for me. Exactly. That's how I genius. That's how I always thought about it is like the situation that you think is bad is actually just like not that bad. If I like did YouTube videos for a whole year and I got zero viewers and nothing happened, I can still go get a job. Like the worst case is really not that worst case. And in fact, I just have like also some faith in myself. If I'm doing something for a year, I'm going to figure something out. It may not be the thing that I think I'm doing, but I'm not going to like, you know, screw myself over that hard. I'm going to be doing something that is moving me in some direction. That's decent. I think that's key. Where does that faith come from? That's a good question. Cause I know a lot of people don't think like that. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't have that faith and that's why everything's terrifying. I think for me, the thing that helped me is like I said, how I like think a lot in my head, I will like go and think of like how I think all the things could turn out. And I, once I think about how the downside is not that downside, I'm like, all right, let's do it. And like, I think the scariest thing can be uncertainty. Like when you don't know what's going to happen, but if you can like quantize like what, I don't even know if that's a word. uh, If the downside is only going to be this bad or roughly this bad, I'm willing to do it then. Like once I've thought it through. That's remarkable. So there's a school of theory from economics called a uh, prospect theory. Yeah. And one of the dictums in it is we're not perfectly rational as humans and able to assess the same way you described. In fact, when you look at expected probability, right, you play a game and there's some expected value if you win and some expected value if you lose, we weight the loss dramatically higher. Yes. And so in our decision-making calculus, because we weight the negative, it feels so much worse to lose out on ten dollars than it feels to gain ten dollars when we weren't expecting either. Yes, we try and avoid that. Oh my God, I'm at least ten dollars, and it feels like. I'm hearing from you is actually you sit down, you calculate, you're like ten dollars, ten dollars. 
maybe it's not $10, $10, maybe it's $5 I might lose, $10 I might gain. Oh, I should definitely do it then. Versus another person might be like, $5 I lose, $10 I gain, but $5 I lose feels like losing $50. So I shouldn't. Yep. I have like two things I think about with that. Yeah. I think one, if you know that you think like that, which I do, then like that helps a little bit because mm-hmm. you can like try to hedge a little bit. And I do think of that. Like I know I don't want to like lose per se. But then the second one is I think you change what it means to lose. Mm-hmm. And then that helps. Like, yes, if if you think of it as losing ten dollars, then that's gonna hurt. But if I think spending money is gonna like get me to a place where like I want or like the transaction and it doesn't work out, like that's sad, but that's that's I did I would rather shoot the shot of that happening and like the probability of it yeah. like coming a certain way of the positive. And it's like asymmetric risk. Like are the things that I always think about is yes, I could fail at this thing and it could not work out, but there was a higher likelihood of it working out. And if it worked out, it worked out a lot better than like yeah. the risk that was associated. And so, yeah, it's painful when you lose. And I, I also don't like it when I lose or like, right. Like if I, a, a company fails, it hurts. Like it's, I'm not immune to these things at all. I think I just change what it means to like win and lose. And that, I think of it in like a longer picture of like, I plan on doing these things for like the next 30 years of my life. Like, how am I going to, I said this a while ago in a tweet, like people want to like write good code and be good coders. Well, the way you do that is writing bad code. Like Mm. I'm winning by losing. Like if you're willing to lose and write bad code or make bad companies, that's actually winning because that's getting you closer to a good company. Take two people. All right, this person has a bad company that failed. This person's never done a company. Which one do you want doing the next company? Well, the person who's at least knows what a company is a little bit and be say they failed, they might have like picked up some knowledge along the way. And so losing is actually winning if you can frame it that way. I kind of love it. Yeah. You win by losing. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to win more yeah. because I'm going to, by your definition, lose more. Exactly. But every loss. You're not even losing ten dollars or five dollars. No, it's just an investment. You just have to reframe what it means. And you see, yeah. I feel like you know, I believe in this thinking now, but I didn't for a long time because I was afraid. Oh God, if I lose, I'm not going to be able to get another job. There's this deep kernel of mental security I'm getting from you. Yes, that's something you just always had, or I think so. I also think if you can do things, usually when that happens too, there's like outside forces that are like in your head or that are like pushing you in a certain direction. And any time you can mm. either remove the obstacle or delay it, that helps a lot. So what do I mean by that? So for example, for me, one of the things that stopped me from like posting on YouTube would be like, it felt really weird if my friends knew I was posting on YouTube. Like that's yeah. something that made me feel weird. And that's yeah. why, that's why at the very beginning, the way I got around that obstacle is not telling them of just like making YouTube videos and no one knew except for myself and anyone who wanted to watch it. Mm -hmm. And so I was fine with that situation, but what I couldn't like, and that was easier for me to like palette and actually do, whereas I would not be able to do that if I had like told my parents or like my friends that I was doing that right away, which a lot of people do and it cripples you because they make fun of you or they say a comment that like gets to you and it's like, uh, so like for example, if I did YouTube for a year and I failed, maybe I just literally wouldn't tell people I failed until like three months after. Like, if I yeah. need to build up the confidence. So I think for me at the beginning, like once you get used to doing this, then you can, it's easier. But at the beginning I would like, yeah, avoid the hard thing that's like is stopping yeah. you. Like hide it. I like that. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I win by losing and I win yeah. by hiding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's do level two. I'm going to pull it. I think we're ready. All right. What is the most unexplainable thing that's ever happened to you? Jeez. That's something unexplainable that's happening. I don't, no, literally nothing comes to mind. I don't think I've had any weird alien encounters. I have zero stories of like this thing randomly happening. Let's say lowest probability. Lowest probability of something happening. Well, I feel like, you know what? I think I won. Uh, <laughs> well, any, anytime you win anything at the casino, it's basically. Like <laughs> you're like, I love you're like the most unexplainable thing is winning at a casino. <laughs> yeah. I think like I got once the like one in 36 chance that like, I think I put something on a number and got that once. That's the lowest probability that's ever happened in my did you, life. Did right you there. win reasonable amounts of money? No, I made like maybe, I think I like put maybe like 10 bucks or like 20 bucks down or whatever the min size bet was. Actually 25 is probably the min size bet. It's like 25 times whatever that was. 
Yeah. What, so a, what a strict interpretation of <laughs> lowest I probability. I can't think of anything crazy because I know some people are going to be like, yeah, like I was, there's this ghost that was like right there. <laughs> like, I know somebody's going to crack those out. I got, no, I'm blank. I got nothing come to my mind for low. What was it? What is the, what is it for you? So similar to yourself, no supernatural yeah. encounters of which I'm aware. However, I think of it this way. I've had a lot of low probability chains of events. E.g., for example, Ben, how did I even meet you? I actually was about to say that. I was like, me being here in yeah. LA. It's the chain yeah. of a series of low probability events. For example, I got to know you initially. I think Elliot Choi connected us. Yeah. Oh, and Ishan. And Ishan. We knew both, actually. It was actually, I was getting a breakfast with Ishan and Elliot. And yeah. that's how I first learned about Carrot. Exactly. You know? So Ishan Goal and Elliot Choi connected us. Yep. I was connected with Elliot, I think, through Ishan Goal. I was connected with Ishan through like the friend of a friend that I met off of a guy off of Clubhouse. Like, this goes deep. Yeah, and so I sort of look at it as every chain that ends up with a successful new relationship always looks like so low probability in retrospect yeah. because it is. And I think it's because you have to view it in context of like all the chains that started but didn't go anywhere. Yep. Yeah. And I also believe if you have enough at bats, the low probability events are going to happen and then they don't become that low probability anymore. We gave the most boring answers to this. <laughs> we're very analytical as we I, think about everyone it. Everyone wanted like, to hear a cool story and we're just like, like unexplainable. <laughs> we're like, well, from a probability perspective, mm. yeah. It's like, well, if you know, it's hard to like flip a coin and know you're going to get heads. But if yeah. you flip a coin 10 times, the probability of not at least getting it once is actually pretty low. So. Yeah. <laughs> Nerds over here. <laughs> Nerd. All right, level two. Oh, it's a wild card. Yeah, let's pick a different one. Let's do wild cards. Have you ever told someone, I love you, but didn't mean it? If so, why? So, in a romantic context, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to answer this one too. Oh, I am. Um... That escalated quickly. Yeah. So in a romantic context, no. When I say I love you, I mean it. I say I love you. No. I remember the first person I ever dated, she had such a funny way of doing this, where when I said I love you for the first time to her, she replied back, I love you too, for some definitions of love. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That's probably worse than saying no. <laughs> it's actually very like... she. At a very strong background in math. Like, that's actually very mathematical. It's it like, this she is. She did an analytical answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, this is true for like some elements within this set. She's like, I love you too, by some definitions of love. And she was like, look, I don't know if I love you for all definitions or even most, but for some. And over time, maybe that'll grow and become most. And I was like, oh, that's like actually very honest. Yep. Right. I think people say it. They just don't usually say for some definitions, for most definitions. I think if there's two analytical people and that happens, it can work. But if one person is not analytical, if someone said that, that to blows you, if up. you Ben said, OK, have you been ever the first person to say I love you to a romantic partner? Uh, no. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Ruthless. Here's here's the other thing, too. I think, too, uh, I'm in the analytical camp. Where if I heard that, I'd be able to like rationalize it in a way where like, okay, like we could like, you know, break this down and figure it out. I would say in general, I'm the type of person where I will say no to a lot of things um, and I will not do a lot of things. But if I say something like I love you or well, obviously not in like content, if I'm making content, it's you don't forget love, content. You don't love all your viewers. Forget any any context that's content, this is not uh, yeah. count in. Um, but outside of content, if I'm say I'm like gonna do a thing, or like I like I'm gonna show up, yeah, or you like, commit to it. Yeah, I commit to it. I'm like actually gonna do it. But I'm gonna say no like every other time. Like I'm a no person. But if you get me to say yes, like I will try my best to be there. Like so, has it's anyone ever happen. said I love you, Ben? He said no. <laughs> has that ever happened? Honestly, no. Because I think I like. I, I'm a person, if I don't think it's like going a place where I want it to go, then I will cut it off very early so wow. we don't get to the place where like they're ready to say I love you and like... So you'll end it. Yeah, I'll, it, like it's way earlier than that that like we we both know this is not going anywhere. Like we're not trying to like 
get to, we're, not, we're not at the I love you point before things. You, you'll start the conversation. Like, how will it be? Will you be like, hey, look, we got, we got to talk. Like, this is just. Well, like, uh, they've never, like, said I love you. And then I said no. So, like, we hadn't got to that point yet. It'd be it'd be just like, you know, I, we either, like, I don't continue being, like, uh, available to, like, see them. Or, <laughs> You're like, like, I'm just like, sorry, I'm busy. Yeah, like, like I. Uh, so, it's never a thing where um, it gets to that point or, like, it, that hasn't happened yet. Um, so you don't so, have the conversation. You just gradually become more unavailable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Until they are also unavailable. So. Damn. Yeah. All right. That is. If it works. That's how it works. Well, also, I think uh, it's one of those things where it's not like uh, both of us think we're serious and then I do that to the person. Mm-hmm. It's more like I'm like I assess people very quickly and maybe yeah. almost too much. To where like it'll be like we hung out like a couple of times and then like I'm done hanging out like it's before it even like gets like very serious. So I, if I was serious with the person, I never do, would never do that. Right, to because you know like, you're like okay. yeah, yeah. Like I'm not I'm not the type of person that's like yeah, we've been dating for like three months and then you never hear from me again. Or like I'm I'm so like you can't hey, come ben, over. Like we've scheduled our wedding for like June 15. Does that work? Ooh, you know I've got a big video coming out that day. Yeah. <laughs> like because I feel bad when I go, so I'm not a person that likes the ghost. Yeah, that feels bad for me. Um, I've learned there are some circumstances where ghosting is favorable, even though it feels bad when I ever do it. Like I will feel like a pit in my stomach when I do it. Um, so I, I'm a person that tends to like tell you upfront, like how I think and like be a pretty straightforward person. So you haven't, so you haven't been the first to say, I love you. Yes. But people said it to you. And then when you say it back, you mean it. Have you ever said it? You don't mean it. No. Not oh, in, yeah, not in a romantic context. S- similarly in a romantic yeah, context, yeah, yeah. when I've said it, I yeah. mean it. But honestly, I don't even, I'm not the type of person that even is saying it outside of like that. Like, I don't think I've like even said I love you to like someone other than my mom or somebody I'm dating or like, yeah. I don't think I'm the person that's like, actually, you know, I probably said I love you, bro, or something to somebody sometime. Well, that's where it gets harder because yeah. I've had friends say it and I do say it back, but I don't mean it in a romantic context. And that's where it's yeah. different. I think it's okay because they also don't mean it in like a rant. Right. It's like contextual. So I think the question's also like in means and that. So we're, I think we're, we're good. You know, we're, <laughs> you're like, we're both you're a like, no. We've sufficiently analyzed we sufficiently, this. We're su- su- both a no. We're good. All right. Level, we're, not, we're not fake. Or maybe we are. Three. And we said ooh, no. Ooh. This is content. Level three. How, how would you describe me to a stranger? I would say Eric is a very tall person. Damn, that giraffe energy. Okay. That giraffe energy. I mean, I'm 5'8 on a good day, so, you know, I'll take it. I would also say very logical thinker who's very driven and is very, like, good at making things happen and, like, following up and making sure, like, like things go smoothly. That's how I would for, for describe you. I describe you as someone I like spending time with. Aw. That I want to get to know better. And I'm actually really happy when you came into L.A. Oh, You let me know you were free. I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad we're playing and, uh, the game. I think you're just like a, just like a really good dude. Uh-huh. I think, yes, you're like obviously like very <laughs> smart. Duh, I feel like it's like table stakes for a friend, right? Like if they're not, you know, you know, you know. And so obviously, I think you're really smart, and I also like admire many things about you, right? From like how you live your life, how you think. No, I'm seriously how you think of a failure, the things you're doing. I think those yeah. things are really, really cool. But more than that, like. I think the easiest test is like, well, I just, I just like spending time with you. Like sometimes Aww. we're not like, sometimes we are not like doing like last night we're playing Mario tennis. This yeah. isn't like productive. <laughs> like, Oh, let's like think about what, to, you know, yeah, we're yeah. just like shooting the shit and like, yeah, yeah. no, I like spending time with you too. Yeah. I've yeah. gotten past the point where everything needs to be always productive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if anything, I think it's actually even more precious when it's not because so much of my life at least is spent on, Oh, there's like a clear productive ends and output out of it. I used to be very much yeah. more productive esque mindset where I would feel very guilty doing non productive things. Right. Yeah. I actually still do to a certain yeah. degree. This is why like I don't have any holiday plans. I'm just like, oh my <laughs> God, I'm gonna be doing something and we see feel shitty. So for me, I know if I'm just like able to be like, hey, let's just play Mario tennis, I know you've entered my tier of people where I feel comfortable enough to just like yeah. play Mario tennis with. That's I the Mario, Mario tennis, tennis tier. level. Yeah, let's e- go. E- exactly exactly. Yeah. That was a good one. All right. Yeah. Are we doing three? Level three. We're doing level three, baby. Right. Three is all the way down. Do you believe everyone has a calling? If so, do you think I found mine? Ooh, two-parter. 
I think people don't have a calling because we live in a pluralistic world, mm. an existential one, where there is no calling for you. The calling is whatever you decide is your calling. Like actually, not in like a bullshitty way, but like you are an amorphous, unformed blob when you come into this world. Like who is anybody to point to you and be like, you'll be a baker? <laughs> like what? Yep. The whole point is you get to decide, right? And you as an amorphous blob slowly become more defined as you gather in input and you have your own internal processing engine and yeah. you certainly begin to grow in like specific directions. Yep. And that's your calling. I think for you, yes, because you're living the life you want to live. And I think that's actually really hard. I think this goes back to my earlier point of security. A lot of people, yep. they're scared. They don't feel like they're living the lives they got to want to live. I had that too for a long time. I... That's why I said I admire, like I wanted to go do my own things, but I was so scared of that failure. I let it keep me working at big companies. And so it took me a while, but eventually I hit that similar place of security as you where I'm like, okay, cool. Like I need to do this. Right. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to learn. And I think as long as you're doing the things you want to do without being stopped by fear, like you are, you are doing your calling. Yeah. So am I doing my calling there? I said, I do think you're doing your calling. Oh. Yeah. I, I would say, um, I do think people have a calling and I think I, ba but I would also, yeah. I say that, but I basically agree with the way you describe it as like, there's like something that the person can do. And maybe it is, there is like two slightly different things you could do that are very similar that would like make you happy and feel fulfilled. Mm. Um, but I do think most people have something that they could be doing. That's like their point of the, what I consider the calling is the point where you feel the most fulfilled and happy is yeah. like the optimal point is what I call the calling. The global like maximum. Yeah. So I agree. There's not like this thing where like this person was born, they were now ready to be a baker. Um, but We're I, just like picking on bakers at this yeah, point. <laughs> Damn. I mean, I love baking. The title of this yeah. video would be Ben Oad hates bakers, but says he does it. Savage. Yeah. Well, you know, the first uh, company I did was a cooking app and there's <gasps> lots of bakers. I remember that. So cooking, baking, I love eating. I love cooking. I love baking. So okay. I, ben Oad loves them. bakers. Yeah. They make great things. So you're like, fine, maybe you don't point at a baby and be like, hot, ha, sorting hat <laughs> style, you shall be a baker. Yeah. But you, you do think there's like a global maxima. I do person. think so for each person. Do you, do you think you're you're at that global maxima? I think, I, I think I'm like, uh, yes. I think I'm like at a place where I'm very happy with like my setup of like what I do on a day-to-day -day basis of like, yeah. and like where I'm like going. So I'm very happy with that. I think you're at a very similar place mm. where maybe you feel like a little stressed sometimes um, but I think if you like zoom out, you're happy with like how you are the, the over our overarching picture. Like, I yeah. think there might be some like minutia things you can do in the day to day to like, you know, differently. But I think the zoomed out calling piece, I think you, you've hit it. I think I'm far closer than I was before. I think right now I'm trying to figure out the balance between being a co-CEO who manages people and what I call IC, individual contributor work, I get to do right. myself like this, which I actually really like. Yeah, I was going to ask you, wait, which one do you think you like better right now? The IC work. Uh, I think by nature, I'm much more of a doer than a manager. Mm -hmm. Like I feel very comfortable going and just getting it done. And I feel far more worried and not certain on how to build and manage systems. That makes sense. I find it really hard. My co-founder actually is much better at the building systems and processes and people part, which is why I'm very lucky to have them. <laughs> And I'm currently, and I think that's what I'm figuring out right now. How do I, how do I grapple in the dissonance between the two? Is it right? Like do you, there's one school of thought. It's like lean into your strengths, right? Don't try and shore up what you're not great at. Just like double down on the thing you're good at. And so, I should just really focus on the things only I can uniquely do for Carrot, right? Right. And then find someone to manage and take over the processes and such. There's another school of thought. It's like no, you're gonna like you're you are a CEO. You're gonna have to dive a little bit more into that and right. figure out how to do it. What about actually? What about for you? Like right now, you you are you are a CEO. I am, and you're doing a lot of it yourself, right? Yep. That maker aspect. I feel like knowing you, that's important to you, right? So but it's really know. interesting. I don't yeah. know what's about to happen to me because we have not hired any employees yet. So I've mm. never been really in a position where I've like hired a person and I'm like fully their manager there's been like some cases that are kind of like a gray area you could call it managing or whatnot because yeah. discord is an interesting place um, but, <laughs> yeah um, okay i would say that like i very much like doing with so i've since i've never managed i don't know for sure but mm. i the, the thought of managing other people doesn't sound disgusting to me 
So wow, strong endorsement. So it, lovely. But like, obviously, I've never done it. I'm very much a person where once I do it, I'm like totally fine, like not doing it and like leaving it if I'm not a fan. So that might yeah. happen to me. We're gonna see. But my gut says I'm gonna like it because I am a person that does like like ops and like setting up systems and doing that sort of thing oh. and like letting stuff flow as well as doing things. So, like I like doing both. Yeah. Um. But I and I don't know how sad I'm gonna get if I'm like just like doing less doer work if you will yeah i'm as of right now my answer is i think i'll be okay it's but great obviously i'm doing all the doer stuff so i feel that's yeah, how i feel as a job. doer right now but that's the only right. thing i can guess yeah i felt somewhat similarly two years ago we didn't yeah. like have any employees right and i think what could be really positive and optimistic you already know you like building the systems part yeah i think for me i always prefer to like let's just run off to the next thing and go launch that and see what happens right so i think that that's yeah. a good sign do you think um yeah. will you and your business partner linda of the two of you which do you think is going to lean more into the managerial part or both that's a good question i think we're probably both going to do it and both of us um i would say would work with employees in a different way because so? we have very different personalities yeah i would say linda's very good at like um a lot of times I can be very like short and to the point. Yeah. And Linda is the complete opposite where she's <laughs> very lengthy and can like very much describe things. And so there's like advantages to both like talking styles and dealing with different type of employees and different employees need each type of like conversation style. Cause like wow. you can talk to a person and they can be like, they can hear Linda talk and they're like, uh, and so like what can you get to the point and then they listen to and then you. they listen to me and then like makes sense but then the inverse also happens they can listen to me and they feel like it's not personal or they like i just like was rude to them or like hey can you give me like a little bit more like what are you doing and then they like love talking to linda and linda can give them the whole stuff and so i think the answer is like both in different ways yeah how do you feel when someone said that to you like oh like this is rude or short to the point like does has this happened and like what do you feel when that occurs i would say that like I'll like I'll think about it and like sometimes I'll be like yeah I probably like could have gave you yeah. like more in the, in the circumstance but I say a lot of times I'd be like I, I'm a person that's like I'm okay if the other person got upset if I think that like um it was like warranted like for mm -hmm. example like sometimes it's not my worth my time to like try to like explain this to you and like get it to a place where like you know you feel good about it because that's just mm -hmm. not worth my time and like sometimes that like feels like a little bit cold i guess right um and it, it this is like different circumstances it can be as simple as like so here's a very a very small example yeah so i told you about how like uh ghosting was like something i didn't like to do yeah so like this also included like receiving dms on social media so at the beginning of your social media life mm. like that's fine you can respond to every person yeah and you can tell enough. them like no thanks i'm yeah. busy and like whatnot um but like the first like cold thing i did which is like not even that cold and like everyone does it is just like stop replying to dms like it on social media like that well i mean of course you're human there's only so many you get exactly so like a hundred thousand so that was the first thing that it felt bad at first was like you just kind of get used to it. there's no other way to, mm, it's like, to, to the point it's like i just don't have time you just don't have time you just can't do it and like so like i'm not even like i don't think i'm ever being like ice cold like that's a pretty like yeah. example of the no one no one's gonna think i'm ice cold but like sometimes i'll feel like a little ice cold doing the thing um and i'd say like yeah stuff like that I don't ever think I'm like trying to be mean, but I'll, I'll be straightforward. And sometimes straightforward is like mean to people. So I, 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 I would always think it as like some people don't like brutally honest people because it like can be hurtful to hear the truth. Um, but I would say I'm not so much at the end of the, the spectrum of like super brutal. I'll like, I'm somewhere in between. Yeah, you're honest. Honestly, that might make you a really good manager. Yeah. I think as a manager, sh I struggle with sometimes because like, Oh, I want to be liked. Right. And then, I'm not always delivering things as clear cut as I can. And actually as a manager, it's just responsibility you have to the person you're supporting. Right. If you don't give them honest feedback, um, what's Yeah, the that's point? the thing. I'm okay not being liked. So yeah. that see that, that that is powerful right there. Yeah. Yeah. You are okay not being liked. And here's the funny thing, I think that goes to a lot of things of if you don't want the thing, the thing almost comes to you. But like if you chase the thing, then it is sometimes harder to like get yeah. to you. Like, so I'd say in a lot of things, I think like that, where like I'm not trying to be liked. So I'm not doing these things that are like cringe that people are trying to do that everyone's like, everyone's trying to be liked. So they're doing the things they don't like it. 
Um, so I think there's like a lot of that of people doing that, that like people find it refreshing now that you try not to be like that. Um, I like it. So I think your superpowers are like one, you have that faith in yourself to right. you're able to like view what others would see as penalties and costs as investments. And three, what you just said right now, right? You're okay with not being liked. Yes. I remember there was a freshman year. Actually, I wasn't a freshman. I was a little bit younger. Um, so I went to community college in high school because I was homeschooled. So you can take college classes early, basically. And one of my history professors, I don't even remember his name. He was kind of like a crazy yeah. person and like went on rants and stuff. But the one thing he did say is he talked about pride. And he was like, the biggest thing that ruins all men in history is pride. He's like, as he's going back through like all the like dictators and whatnot, whatever pride is the thing that got to him. He's like, even day to day life, blah, blah, blah. He talked about pride. And I was like, for whatever reason, I was like, yeah, I can get behind like throwing my pride away. Like I'm okay, like losing and like um, mm. being like someone that is not saying not liked in a certain circumstance. Like I don't liked being disliked. So I'm not trying to be disliked. Yeah, but if it happens in the course of winning. Exactly. So there's, there's like three categories you can be in. There is, I'm actively trying to be liked and I will like do sacrifices yes. for that. Cause here's the thing. I'm also like trying to be liked. I'm not like not trying to do that, but yeah, there's, yeah. when there's conflict, I'm okay. Not being liked. That's like the best way to describe it. I'd say it's like when you, when you gotta be the way you gotta be honest and blunt, yep. you'll do it without fear of that. Yep. Tell you, man, that's a superpower. Yeah. And sometimes it hurts, but it like, it hurts like me too. Like, but I will just like sometimes like block out my brain and like do the thing that I need, know like needs to happen. And that's like the overthinking. I like try to shut that off. I actually think you'll be a good manager. <laughs> Cause I think <laughs> as a manager, the instinct is to be their peer and their friend. Yeah. But that actually doesn't make you a good manager. Yes. So I think the thing that also helped was making content. Cause as soon yeah. as I like there, like realize my fans, not my peer, like that's like a different relationship and you have to like just treat it differently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because okay. at the beginning, I wanted to be the YouTuber that responded to every YouTube comment. Yeah, too. I was going to say, and this like, is really important for you. Because yeah. I was like, I never would have expected you to reply to every DM. But this is, yeah. a, this is a moment where like, I can't anymore. No, there was a point in time where I would, like felt bad about it. And it was like a whole thing. Because and if you've been a fan of mine for a while, you'll see the progression. Like at the very beginning, I was very active with my community. Like I am like in the weeds. I'm responding to every YouTube comment. Um, and then I like just slowly like pulled back more and more and more and other, I just got busy with other stuff too. Like I'm just like doing less YouTube and content in general right now. Cause I'm busy with doing a startup, but like I did just like pull back, pull back, pull back. Cause like you can't yeah, you be, to distance yourself. If you want to be a big content creator, you also can't be in the weeds all the time. Yeah, It's just like the reality of the situation. So I get that. And I didn't understand that when I was a small YouTuber because I was like, I want to be the guy that responds. Even yeah. when he's like, like, some people don't respond. That's not me. Yeah. I'm going to be better response to everyone. Oh, so, yeah. Like I learned. All right, let's do a couple more. All right. Here's the one I pulled. Okay. What would make you feel closer to me? Um, if we got rid of this table right here. <laughs> I like it. Practical. I'm like trying to think, can we get rid of the table? There goes our mic arms. How about this? How about we hold hands? Oh, that's way better than I was going to yeah. do. <laughs> I was literally going to move the table and we sit on this side. I'll do a compromise. We'll hold hands. Let me move the table back now. Oh. Nice handshake. Very intimate. Yeah. All right. Let's answer this last question then holding hands. All right. All right. Your turn. Oh, it's a little one. Oh, it's a wild card. We don't do wild cards. Oh, it's another wild card because I can see it from my ankle. <laughs> If you could prescribe me one thing to do for the rest of the month, what would it be and why? As I hold your hand. <laughs> I think I do feel closer. Wow, physiologically. Yeah. This, is, this is not a cop out answer. I actually really admire the way you live your life. Like I'm oh. not... Like I'm not trying to like I'm like I, I like the way you do think oh, about things. I like I don't, it too. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. So let's let's do a different one. I don't think okay, I would, okay. I don't think I would prescribe you to do. Oh, that's another wild. That's an over. I don't think I would prescribe you to do right. anything differently. What do you think I fear the most? I know you don't really necessarily fear not being liked. I know you don't necessarily fear failure. Well, I can fear the thing and still do it. 
Ooh, ooh, yeah. true courage yeah. is having the fear and exactly. still doing it. So uh, maybe you fear. So what gets me the most scared? Maybe you fear just not winning mm. or not being true to yourself. I, I don't know. Mm. What do you think? I would say, let me think. I would say, I don't think I actually fear not winning because I, maybe I'm just like literally have too big of an ego. I actually just think it's like kind of impossible over the course of 50 to years not win. to not win. Yeah, no, I get if, it. Cause you're like, even if I lose this time, I'm going to win overall. Yeah. Like I think of it like 50 years from now, if I, there's like just no way I don't win in some shape or form, like it may not be in the thing I think wow, I'm going to win at, What confidence. but like if I, if I, if I'm on the right track or at least what I think is the right track or a track that I'm happy going down, if I'm enjoying the journey then like, that's like the important part. And so I think I don't fear winning per se, but I I definitely would say like I do fear like um, actually I fear bodily harm the most. There you go. I think that's what I would say I fear the most. I think I'm just like a little bit of a scaredy cat when it comes to those. But things. I feel like that's why he didn't want to really like skiing when <laughs> yeah <laughs> like skiing what, what, like skiing was very skiing was good for me because it was like something where it's like I'm constantly overcoming my fear. Yeah. Like so I watched a video of myself skiing in the moment I was like super scared. Like I'm like. Like, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. My skiing is slipping. I'm like, fall slow. I watch it back. I'm going like two miles per hour. Like, I'm just going so slow. When you watch yourself back in the video, you're like, was I really that scared for that? Like, whoa, bro. I, f- I feel like you're basically losing your last weakness. <laughs> you know, like, because I feel like mentally you're really strong. I, yeah. I do think the one thing that I lucked out with was like a very strong mental. I agree with that. I like, that was, that was the thing. There's like things that I'm not good at, but that was the one thing that like, helps in a lot of areas yeah yeah it's powerful all right now thank you so much ben this is yeah. it Here, give me thank a you how you feeling i feel good i feel closer me too. that's great man yeah so welcome back to the extended cut let's go and i think the realization i have after this is just like ben you have tremendous mental strength <laughs> <laughs> i guess i do but you said you feel like you learned things about yourself <laughs> during this too. And no, way? I did. I was like, I was saying it and I was also like fearing because I was trying to think about the questions like, why am I this way? Or like, why do I think about it that way? Um, and I was like, oh, wait, that's that makes sense. Like, that is probably why I think that way. You said as a kid, you win in tennis by tiring the opponent out. So even yes. young, you were just like, I'm just going to outlast and I know I'm going to win. Right. So funny enough, as a kid, so as I was playing tennis, that was a sport I was the best at. I was bad at all the other sports. Um, and I don't know why I chose this as a strat is how I wanted to win. But a lot of kids love like trying to hit winners or like uh, hitting it really hard and the opponent like just getting wrecked that way. But the way I wanted to play the game was I would just like return and play very defensive every shot you hit until my opponent would make a mistake. And then eventually they get frustrated because they've made like five mistakes in the last five points. And they're like, uh, and they get mad. And so I always was the person like, I tried to outlast you playing tennis. Um, I don't know why I did that, but I did. And that just like, I guess stuck with me as I've always thought of it as like an, an outlast mentality as I actually never thought of myself as a smart kid or a smart person. I always thought of myself as I'm willing to do this thing longer than the other person. And that's like how I tried to do it. So like in tennis, I was like just trying to outlast you. So where, where do you think that came from? I have no idea. <laughs> it might literally just be watching Gary V. Like in Gary V's all no, about No, but you like, were not watching Gary V when you were like a 10-year-old playing tennis. That, that is true. I have no idea why I was doing that in tennis other than like, I don't know. I think a little bit is, part of it is like, I'm a little bit of a scaredy cat. So I would be scared of hitting the ball out. Like it, <sighs> you actually can't... It, I like I was scared of making mistakes in tennis. And so if I was scared of doing those things, the easiest way is like hit simpler shots and like don't take as much risk when you're playing like in tennis. Like because when you hit winners, it's a risky play. You either win the point or you lose the like, I'm just gonna outlast. So the funny thing there is I actually was risk averse in tennis, I'd say. Um, but like for example, in YouTube, I was just like, I'm bad at making YouTube videos, so I'm gonna go make a hundred YouTube videos. And there was like a year where I made posted a YouTube video every single day of like coding tutorials. Like who's posted 365 coding tutorials? Nobody. And like I would just do some crazy thing where like, all right, guys, we are gonna like make Slack and we're gonna post a video every day for the next three months. And at the end of three months, 90 videos in, we have a Slack clone. I feel like in your head you've internalized things that might be risky into ways that don't seem risky. A few different ways. One yeah. is just like, is what you said, hey, if I'm just getting started in the algorithm and I don't know how it works, let me just hit the ground strokes. Yep. Simple, basic shots, 
before I started to focus on quality, yep. get to hit it in. And that's low risk because these are just, just hit it there, put it out there. Yep. Or set it up in ways where like the thing that might go wrong, like, oh, I might hit the ball out of bounds. Oh, yeah. if I tell my mom and my friends about it, they might shit on me. I just won't do that. Yeah. And so I feel like you've learned to take risky things and conceptualize them in your head where they're like actually super not risky. And the final third thing, and I think this is the most powerful mentality you have is, okay, cool. Even if I lose this one time, this is just but one learning step on my path to ultimate victory that you just have supreme confidence in. You asked me where it comes from. I think, I think really it's two things. I think one, I think just genetics. There are certain traits like neuroticism that yeah. to some degree are genetically determined. I know I have a high degree of neuroticism. Yep. I highly, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I highly suspect that if you took it, you would have a low degree of neuroticism. Mm. And I think the second, it is your upbringing, your environment. Yep. Potentially the parents the friends you had growing up, the combination of having low neuroticism to start with in a supportive environment yeah. has brought you to a sense of confidence that's not dependent on external validation. Yep. That's like really important to like, even if you're not at the one end of the spectrum, if you're posting on social media, you kind of have to try getting closer to the not getting validation from social media. Otherwise, it's like really hard and you can spiral. Like, I don't actually think you're posting videos to try and gain clout and validation. Yeah, no. I think you're literally just posting the videos because you like posting the videos. I do. And you're like, why wouldn't I share my life? It's like a game. I think of it as a game. I like really just enjoy the game of like content of like trying to post a video that does well, that I enjoy making and that like people like get some value out of. Like, that's like a fun game for me. I was a gamer growing up and then I went cold turkey in college and the new game became like businesses and like startups and YouTube and all that stuff is like my new video games. I'm going to tell you most of the creators I know, yeah. this is, oh God, it's not doing well. Yeah. This is not, mm, no big deal. I get that too though. Like if I yeah. will post a video and it flops, I feel like a pit in my stomach and it feels bad. But the key thing I try to do is like stop thinking about that. Like we're, we're like done thinking about, like let's do something else. Like yeah. if I post a bad video, the thing that like d helps me the most is, all right, we're going to put our phone up. We're not going to check the comments anymore today. We're going to just go like play, do some coding. Like coding is like a very relaxing activity for me. It like makes me feel good and I focus on the thing. Um, so I still feel these things too, but whenever they happen, I like push them f as far away yeah. as I possibly can. It's actually a tenet. So you've probably heard of cognitive behavioral therapy. Yep. There's another school called dialectical behavioral therapy. Okay. It's very similar. It's more focused on, hey, look, you're feeling bad things. Let's just try and make sure you aren't feeling the bad things. Let's not worry as much as the cognitive mechanics because right. cognitive behavioral therapy, you're thinking through like, okay, my mind went from this event to this really bad story prompting these negative feelings. If I change how my mind makes that mapping from event to bad outcome, then right. I'll reduce the feeling. Right. Dialectical behavioral therapy is more just focused on like, let's not worry about the internal workings. Like you have this feeling. <laughs> right. Like what do we do around this feeling? If we make the feeling go away, we've, we've done our job. Yeah. And one of the main tenets within dialectical behavioral therapy is Distress tolerance is just in the moment when you are distressed, what is the thing you can do so you feel less distressed? And then everything else, your thoughts and such, they'll sort of just work themselves out. And yeah. you literally just described to me a ten of distress tolerance. You're like, I'm upset, put my phone away, don't look at the comments, go yeah. code. I got over the bad feeling in the yeah. moment, I'm good. I definitely do a mix of both of those. Yeah. And I say too, I'm also a big person who's a huge proponent of sleep. Like I just know for a fact <laughs> I am less angry. My head feels better. Like I can think clearly. Things happen better. I get upset less when I sleep nine hours. Like I'm a person where sleeping nine hours is very, very important. I can go a couple days with not sleeping nine hours and I'm fine. But if I'm not doing that on a regular basis, I crumple as a person. So like I check myself and I'm <laughs> You're like, like aluminum can. Exactly. Like if if that's not happening, that's the first thing I'm like, all right, we're doing everything so I can fix it that I'm sleeping nine hours. And then once I'm sleeping nine hours, check. Everything else like is easier from there. Like life is just easier when I sleep nine hours, and life is so much harder when I don't. I love it because both of us are not operating on much sleep right now. <laughs> like I actually feel okay right now because I like when I'm doing a podcast, I have like a different brain than my day to day life brain. Yeah, you're a little more focused. Yeah, and so like I I don't even feel like any kind of sleepy right now. Like I'm just chilling. That's dope. Yeah. All right. This is the first time ever I've ever done a run back. Let's go. Because it's just like this stuff's so interesting. Yeah. I want to share it. Yeah.